These handcrafted dioramas tell the stories of Aegis, a planet overcome by a mysterious fungus. Our story and build today occur on the beaches of Ludania, on the southern fringe of the Royal Balami territory. I'll take you on my seven-week journey conceptualizing, building, and painting this walker, and as always, we'll end with an original short story. This is Gamey Builds, and you're watching Beyond the Blight. For most of my mechanical builds, the project starts with analyzing the pieces I have on hand. And for this one, I wanted to repurpose an airplane model kit, this classic Star Wars ATSD model, this cheap tank kit, and some lovely Gundam sprues. Of course, using larger parts from such recognizable designs meant that it was going to be essential to be as transformative as possible. For my concept sketches, I'm basically just kit bashing on paper trying out various shapes and pieces to fill out the forms and surfaces, then adding detail with smaller pieces as I go. Obviously, the tricky part here is getting the relative sizes and dimensions right, since the end result could deviate wildly from the concept if some crucial piece was not drawn to relative scale. The other challenge here was matching the scale of the walker to its pilot, a 136th figure from the same kit that I made KP-1301 from way back in this build. In some ways, this ideation process is the scariest part of any build, because everything that follows, from the finished physical product to the intellectual contribution to my fictional world, is dictated by what is drawn here. And the more that this world grows, the more the rules governing it are clearly defined. For example, one decision that's posed the biggest challenge to me so far was making repulsor engines, this universe's anti-gravity tech, in short supply at this point in the planet's history. That means that most vehicles have either legs or tires to get around, or are else aerodynamic enough to achieve flight with propulsion. This is one of the reasons I haven't made many hover ships, speeders, or similar vessels on Aegis, although I do plan to do some of these in the near future. In the meantime though, building mechs and walkers is probably one of my favorite types of builds, which, well, you probably figured out. For the color palette, I decided to go with a nice, rusty scheme, with plenty of browns, reds, and dusty oranges. To break up the monotony some, I also added some yellows and greens. And for the terrain, I quickly sketched in and painted these not-quite-fungus, not-quite-coral plant structures, which then sparked the idea for a beach scene, a kind of terrain I haven't yet attempted. Before we get to the build stage, you may have noticed that my audio for this video is especially crispy, and that's thanks to the Stellar X2 microphone from TZ. This condenser microphone does an absolutely incredible job of blocking out background noise and really honing in on just my narration, making it one of my favorite new tools for video creation here on YouTube. I used to have to jump through all kinds of hoops to get quality audio, but this microphone does all that for me. So if you're in the market for a top quality recording option, check out the link to the Stellar X2 in the video description. I went through quite a few options before actually getting started on this phase of the build, beginning with this model tank frame. What I eventually settled on, however, was a super cheap and flimsy toy truck from the dollar store. I really have to be in the mood to create vehicle frames and templates from scratch. I'd much rather find an existing form of the general shape and size, so this find was perfect. While at the dollar store, I also picked up these die-cast toy cars for their interesting shapes and potential greeblies. One warning about using cheap toys, though, is that often the plastic is soft, almost rubbery. That makes it easy to cut, but hard to get a clean edge after sanding. So I prefer using these types of plastic for the base form, and then covering up as much as I can with better quality materials. One such material is 2mm styrene, which I used for the base wall panels. With the panels attached, I reconnected the side walls to the trailer base, then superglued it all together. To form the room at the end of the walker, I modified these panels, which came from the ATST walker model shown earlier. 
I also primed these in a light gray color since they needed to be painted early on in this build. The army painter was kind enough to send me this amazing set of speed paints to try out for this build. Though water-based, these speed paints have a slightly oily consistency and are highly pigmented, allowing the recesses of whatever is painted to really soak in the color. In a short time, you get a really nice effect, especially on things with plenty of texture, like these control panels and consoles. After a dry brushing with some lighter tans and browns, I assembled the rear room. I did a bit more painting with the speed paints on the floor here, then here, then attached the room with some epoxy putty. With the bulk shapes of the body done, it was time to cover everything in delicious detail. It's almost poetic that I'm kit bashing here with Star Wars model kits, because the original Star Wars models used to film the movies were themselves kit bashed from models of airplanes, submarines, cars, and even tanks, like this piece here that I immediately recognized from my little flea build. For the Greeblies that I didn't want lying completely flat on the surface, I added a bit of epoxy sculpt. This helped give the resulting form just a bit more dimension and shadow. Epoxy Sculpt is also great for adding soft sculpted details and for attaching larger or oddly shaped pieces that don't quite offer many points of contact for super gluing. I next broke open the Matchbox cars as I found some scintillating details that I thought might work well for the undersides of the walker. Since purchasing my jeweler saw a couple of builds back, I'm able to work with die cast metal and being able to modify these cars opens up a lot of new possibilities. After sealing up this Jeep's windows with styrene, I attached a seat to the underside to begin building out the cockpit. The ATST's innards made for a cool straddle console that fit the figure perfectly. Another brand new material for me was green stuff, also a two-part epoxy compound, but with a stickier, harder texture. This stuff is absolutely perfect for sculpting finer details, like the padding of this pilot's seat. It's often used for adding details to minis as well, and did a great job of hiding the seams in my female figure. After a few more alterations, like these armrest controls, and the addition of these riveted panels made by indenting the backsides of some thin styrene, I glued everything together, then got working on the walker's underside. I thought this tank hole had a nice shape for that, but it was much too wide, so I hacked it up, threw away the middle section, then fused the two sides back together with generous amounts of superglue and epoxy sculpt. One thing I love about epoxy sculpt is that it's easily smoothed and formed with a bit of water. Finally, some greeblies and holes for the appendage axles were added. To fill in the cavity of the undercarriage, I tried another new product, foam sealant. A word of caution here, this stuff is sticky, hard to control, and expands way beyond its original footprint. It also doesn't really cut well with a wire cutter, but a saw did the trick, leaving me with a lovely clean edge and something substantial for the axles to glue into. The final bit was the rear roof area and cargo crane. I added some tiny styrene fringes to the ATST roof, this strut from the original toy trailer, then sliced up some styrene square tubes for the crane arm. Tank bits were glued to the interior of the tubes, and then it was attached with superglue and a bit of green stuff to counteract the sloping angle of the roof. Bent guitar wire made for a perfect crane cable, and lastly came this miniature plastic hook. In the course of making several of these walker-type mechs, I've learned that it's advantageous to start with the hip joints, since those bear the weight of the body and are thus the most crucial parts, structurally speaking. With the joints done, I could then add details, like these Gundam jetpacks. Epoxy sculpt helped to fill in some of the gaps and also strengthen the joints. It also gave the wires attached to the joints something to grip onto. Of course, epoxy sculpt isn't necessarily an adhesive on its own, so I later had to come back and add superglue to ensure adhesion. This process continued for each joint, attaching appendages with wire, adding a layer of epoxy sculpt for strength, 
sculpting it, and letting it dry for a few hours, then moving on to the next section. With everything completed down to the ankles, I jumped into Blender, where I modeled some feet. I based them on the design of camel's hooves, as I felt the original design bore a resemblance to that animal and wanted to nudge that suggestion a bit further. I also snapped a quick picture of the model thus far, so that within Blender I could easily design the handrails for the top deck of the walker. I did this by creating a curve in the shape I wanted, then referencing an object, in this instance a rectangle with curved corners, to give the handrails an industrial look. I used this same object to create a set of ladders, so that the pilot and other crew could easily access the top deck once the walker lowered itself to the ground. Then I copied, rotated, and edited the handrails to create a new set to provide access from the cockpit to the deck. I know there's some debate over the use of 3D printing in projects like these, and I'll be the first to admit that it isn't as intriguing to watch as scratch building or kit bashing, but with my limited skills in those areas, there are certain items I simply cannot make by hand. So being able to create these tiny, highly detailed pieces with the use of a resin printer is huge for me. Also, with the cost of high definition 3D printers being just over $100, they're accessible to almost everyone. One of my favorite details in the original concept art was this tiny hovering pod called a seeker drone, or pilta homek, literally dumb pod. These drones are capable of tracking objects at great distances, be it biological entities or mechanical things. By tethering it to her walker, this pilot is able to hijack the drone's sensors, override its connection to the satlink, and co-opt it for her own purposes. Uh, more on that story to come. And speaking of stories, if you're wondering about my upcoming novel, here's an update. I'm about halfway done writing the first draft. I'm expecting the book to be roughly 350 pages, so not a novella, and certainly not just an anthology of short stories like I've released on this channel. Instead, the novel begins on Fis Alim, the snowy southern pole of Aegis. If you've been following my videos, you'll probably have an inkling of what short stories this will connect to, but if not, hopefully I've just given you some impetus to dig into my video catalog. The novel will be accompanied with an audiobook of my own narration, and I'll do my best for a simultaneous release. And yes, this novel will answer most of the big questions about the Blight, while raising some new ones. While I don't want to give away too much about the story yet, I will say that once the book is out, there will be a lot of new things to explore with future builds. To attach the feet to the legs, I glued on some plastic beads, added some wire, then covered it all in epoxy sculpt. Then it was all stuck together and left to harden for a few hours. The idea for the pilot's console is that it would rotate forward on a small hinge at the nose of the cockpit, allowing the pilot to easily enter and exit. So to get that look, I added tiny Gundam bits along with this plastic Q-tip segment to suggest some sort of hinge. The handrails were then glued onto the deck along with the side ladders. Then these struts from the original trailer toy were re-added as supports for the awning. Finally, the slanted handrails for the step up to the deck. I next added some tiny plastic cables, after which the painted area was taped off to make priming easier later on. Finally, the finished cockpit area was attached to the rest of the body, which had been filled off camera with more of that expanding foam. A big part of model making is knowing the strengths and weaknesses of various glues. For a lot of situations, super glue works just fine, but for swiveling joints, I found that nothing beats Gorilla Glue. The only issue is that it takes hours to dry. So, for a complex build like this, everything has to be held perfectly in place. 
To do this, I make a temporary base from thick foam, then use long skewers topped with masking tape to create a stand. Then, once the legs are carefully glued and posed, I go in and adjust the height and angle of the skewers to get a firm hold. The result is pretty janky looking, and I try not to breathe on the thing for fear of it collapsing in a pile of ruined plastic, but it does get the job done. I return to my old method of using a cheap decorative frame for the base. To make the center flush with the edges, I added a bit of foam board, then built up one of the corners to match the slight elevation of the rear right leg of the walker. Voila! I then covered everything in a layer of epoxy sculpt. In the past, I've used air dry clay for this step, but the issue with air dry clay, which is water based, is that it shrinks slightly as it dries. Epoxy, on the other hand, relies on a chemical reaction between two compounds for hardening, meaning that it keeps its original footprint. Otherwise, it behaves in much the same manner as air dry clay, softening with water and generally being really easy to work with. Once the epoxy sculpt had been shaped into a sandy ocean floor, I cleaned up the edges by trimming the excess and using it to fill the gaps. While still soft, I also got the walker's footprint in the sand, which would ensure a snug fit when gluing later, but also provide for a bit more realism. Some holes were also added here for the coral and plant life that would come after painting. Unfortunately, while I really liked the look of this base, especially after the paint job, the resin pour that followed really flushed that hard work down the drain, as it came out much too opaque to appreciate the details. Ah, resin. And with all the pieces complete, it was time to paint. But before we get into the short story, there's one tiny money-saving tip I want to share and that is soaking regular spray primer in a bowl of warm water before application. Typically, this cheap spray paint goes on much too thick, but by warming up the can a little bit, it went on in a super fine mist, and the results are identical to the expensive hobby stuff I've been using. And what will you do with all that saved money? Well, you could hop on over to gamybuilds.com and snag one of these brand new Beyond the Blight posters. I would have liked to have made new tees with this design too, but I'm just about out of space for merch in my tiny little office slash workshop. So to help clear space for the new year, I'm running a sale on everything and offering free shipping on US orders $60 and over. Go check out gamingbuilds.com for more. I and borderless. I live a life of wandering the coast, where the air is clean enough to breathe without choking on spores. I didn't ask for this life, didn't seek it out. But I won't patronize you by saying it sought me out either. There's no destiny at work here, no serendipity. It's simply the life I found, the one my circumstances sifted me through, like silt through a strainer. I'm here now, and I'm not complaining. I was born into the life of a nomad. My parents were coastal merchants, driving the four-legged hunk of rust we call a helljat, a shallow strider. In those days, we prowled the coastline, from wharf to fishing village to naval base, hawking our wares, bartering with the occasional Malasha flotilla, and once in a red tide, even ripping off some green naval recruits by selling them spice salt water as a cure for seasickness. These days, though, there's no business for coastal merchants. The towns that haven't been washed away by seasonal storms or flooded up to their gills have been plucked apart by skin hiders. The residents have been forced inland. There's no one to buy from or sell to, so I've turned to other sources of revenue. It could be worse. I could be stuck in one of the crumbling Balami citadels. These days, it doesn't matter which side you're on, whether you're clinging to the remnants of your royalty, subsisting on what little tribute the nearest enclave is still willing to provide, 
or you're the descendants of the servants since the uprisings, stuck with a restless populace you can hardly manage any better than the royals who preceded you. Endless conflicts, endless scrounging for resources in the desert and the dust of the Unders cave networks. I'm glad I'm not one of them. Finding the crash secret drone was a new beginning. It had been tangled in some overgrowth on the side of a cliff. Batteries dead, trackers malfunctioning, easy pickings. I hauled it to safety with my crane, and while I'm no grease wizard, I've learned enough over the years to know how to fix a thing or two. And so, after a couple months of tinkering on the seeker, it was airborne once again. He'll think I'm silly for saying this, but seeker drones are kind of like dogs. I mean, that's how they've been programmed. They pick up a signal and will stick to it until their mission is complete. But my little pod couldn't remember its mission. Someone had taken a pot shot at it with a beam rifle, deftly puncturing its memory banks and frying them to a crisp. New chipsets had to be installed. So when it finally booted up, it just stared at me with those doughy oculars and followed me around like a lost puppy. Its spatial positioning sensors were probably busted too, because it kept nudging and bumping me. Then again, maybe that's just standard protocol for job acquisition readiness, as the chippers would say. So I tried giving it a job. Seeker drones are equipped with impressive tracking instruments. They can identify very specific bio signs from dozens of kilometers away. So I told it to find me an unpolluted fishing hole. And for the next month, I was feasting on roasted sandfish and porcupuscles. It could track the blight, too. So I lashed it to the front of my strider and made sure it always kept us upwind of the spores. I tracked other things, too, like a human biosignature that washed up on the shore one day and turned out to be a fugitive from an island prison colony. That netted me a hefty bounty and put a new rack of hip joints on the strider. But what I really enjoy trading are stories. There's an old sailor's saying out here that only the sea and love wash away the ink of borders, and I think it's true. This is the only place on all of Aegis where one can rub shoulders with Corsaki infantrymen, Automeca engineers, Ekrite professors, sailors from every imaginable port, weathermen, parasite pilots, and even a Balami prince, all with a story to tell. Tell me a story, and I'll tell you one. Ah, the purest form of barter. Of course, the stories are like opinions. Everyone has one, but few can be trusted. They're seldom removed from the lens of the teller's perception and bias. But what is fascinating to me is that, given enough stories, told through enough lenses, you can begin to piece together the truth. The embellishments and exaggerations rise to the top like sea foam and are blown away. But the truth, like treasure, sinks. I barter in stories, but the facts, those are mine to keep. Thank you all so much for watching. If you want to check out more photos from the original Star Wars kit-bashed models that have provided so much inspiration to amateur model makers like myself, check out my pinned comment below. Until next time, this is Gamey Builds, over and out.